In AD 55 or 56, the Apostle Paul from the city of Ephesus writes a letter back to Christians in the Greek city, the city of Corinth. They've got some issues, they've got some problems. In fact, yes, most students of the Bible, which congregation of Christians in the New Testament had more problems than anybody else. Corinth is the answer that you'll almost always hear. Why is that? In chapter 1, Paul starts out by thanking God for, for them. In fact, this is what he says. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge. He continues by saying not just utterance and knowledge, but that even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. That does not end the sentence. Paul characteristically writes in long sentences, but I want to talk about the enrichment of these individuals. Because you have a, pe a group of people in the city of Corinth that are enriched but have all sorts of flaws in the way that they live and in what they think. And they shouldn't. And Paul mentions three areas. He says you're enriched in everything by Christ in all utterance. Number one, in the message that you've heard, but actually also in the way that you speak and share that same message with others the words that you use. And more than the details of the message, it's the way that you actually describe certain things or even talk to people around you. What kind of feeling or, or condition of the heart actually comes across in how you say certain things and what you say? In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus made the statement, the things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Those things defile a person. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, fault and witness, blasphemies. Those are the things that defile people. It doesn't have to be that way. If we're enriched in the way that we speak, then we speak in the same kind of manner or endeavor to speak in the same kind of manner as Jesus did. There's a, a compassion that comes across for individuals around us, even if we disagree with them. There's a love that we have for them. We want people to actually understand facts. We don't beat them over the head because they don't. We don't spit at them. We don't do any kind of violence to them. That is, if we're individuals that believe in God and believe in Christ. If people don't, that may be another story altogether. So here are people in the city of Corinth, Christians who are enriched in utterance, but also enriched in knowledge. The way that they use what they know. There's a statement that Paul writes to, uh, to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is what he says. Know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, arrogant, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And then he says, from such turn away. Two verses later, he describes those same individuals this way. They're always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Always learning, never able to come to knowledge of the truth. Why? They don't want to. It doesn't matter what the facts are. They know how they feel. Don't confuse them with truth. They'd rather wallow in error. That's tragic. But times really haven't changed. Paul, writing to the Christians in Corinth, is thankful to God that they've been enriched in all utterance and all knowledge. They know the message they've heard. They know what to say as they share that message. They know how that impacts the way that they live. There's a knowledge they have about that, and it really filters over into the action. The third phrase, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, even as the message of Christ, the words of Christ, the story of Christ, the word that's translated confirmed carries with it uh, something that's made firm, something that is sure, something that's been established. How do you establish the message of Christ in your life? By the way that you apply it, by the way that you live it. 
So initially, Paul says, you've been enriched in, in all of these ways. The question is going to be, what happened? Because not long after this, still chapter 1, here's the, prob the first problem of the list. I plead with you, brethren, verse 10, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. It's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. And I say this, each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, another name for Peter, or I am of Christ. Divisions, contentiousness, bickering, arguments. Now, is it the case that Apollos is teaching something diametrically opposed to what Jesus said? That's not what Paul has in mind. Or is Paul saying that I teach something totally different from what Jesus actually taught? No, he's not suggesting that either. Or Peter. Peter's out alone. Peter just says stuff that's just off the cuff. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So, so he's, he's thing, saying things are contradictory to what Jesus. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul's talking about personalities. Same gospel, same message, same principles, same truth. Oh, but I like the way that Apollos words it. This guy has just a, a golden tongue. He can word things and paint pictures so vividly. I could listen to him all day long. I don't care about the rest of these guys. Or somebody else that says, well, I like Peter. I like Cephas. Because Peter is one of these guys that's just down to earth. Not polished at all. In fact, Peter is liable to stick his foot in his mouth and say things that are just not really correct as far as culture is concerned. He's just a fisherman, but I like that. And then you had somebody who said, well, I, I like the way that Paul kind of analyzes things. I like that personality, and I like that approach. What's the problem? Several questions that are asked in verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul, what do you mean? Here are people that are enriched in the knowledge that they should have of the gospel and the, the message they've heard and the way that they share that message and how they understand with that knowledge how that message should be applied in their life. And that third category is the way that they live that life. But it's all clouded by the kind of bickering that takes place, the argumentation back and forth, the... Uh, Divisions that exist among them. There is no unity of thought or life or concern. They're gravitating toward certain individuals and leave others out. I like these people, but I don't like you. Paul says that's wrong. The problem, even in those questions, is Christ divided. You're allowing personalities to overtake unity that should exist. Was Paul crucified for you? You're allowing individuals that you see as the best servant of God, their personality, to rob you of what these other servants of God actually say. And they're not saying things that are contradictory to one another, but their approach may be somewhat different. The fact's the same, the approach may vary. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Where did your allegiance actually lie? In religious circles, it's not uncommon to hear somebody say, well, I really like the way so-and-so preaches. Okay. What about sermons from other individuals? Well, I just I don't think I, I can really listen to them. Are they saying something that's wrong? If they're saying something that's true, focus on the truth more than the approach. Focus on the Christ rather than people that are talking about the Christ. Here is a divided congregation in Corinth. Here are people that bicker and argue back and forth. And it's, it's more than just a, a religious kind of mindset, although you see that all around the world. People that believe that all you have to do is just believe that Jesus is the Messiah and everything else is okay. Is that what Jesus said? Just believe that I am the Christ and you can do anything you want to. 
I'll die for you on the cross, but it doesn't make any difference how you live. I'm going to teach a lot of these parables to my disciples. I'm going to, to send the apostles out on a very special mission. I want them to teach others who can teach others who can teach others. But down the line, I don't care if you teach what I taught or not. Is that what Jesus said? You would almost think so by the way the religious world is divided. That doesn't make any sense. Jesus prayed for unity, not division. Jesus wanted truth to be followed, not feeling, not whatever I want truth to be. Jesus focused on the principles of God's word, not personalities. That spills over into the way they actually people view other things in our culture. People that look at somebody's personality that they like or they don't like more than what has that person done or what have they not done? What have they accomplished or what have they not accomplished? You can take the same kind of principle and the problem of the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and put it in the way that people look about education, the way people talk about politics, the way people take a look at the government, the way people view a whole host of things. And so very often personality gets in the way and we end up being selective in our facts. Just like people in religious circles are selective with what they want to follow as far as God's word is concerned. And they fit into that category that Paul writes about later to Timothy. People that are ever learning and never able to come to knowledge of the truth because they don't want to. Don't distract me with facts. I like the way that I feel. And if I look at the facts, I may determine that I've actually reached some wrong conclusions and that can't be correct. I cannot allow that. The little secret is nobody's perfect. There's only one perfect person who ever lived and they crucified him. None of us are perfect. All of us are students of God's word. All of us can learn. The Christian has been enriched in all utterance and all knowledge and then the message of Jesus is confirmed in their life by the way that they live. But being divisive doesn't have a place within the body of Christ. Truth of God's word is something that is held up always because it's God's word that is the authority, not you and not me. May we live in such a way that the principles of God's word actually filter over beyond a Christianity in every, as every aspect of our life. And when we keep the messages of God's word very, very real in the way that we live day to day, please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.